Uh, my name is Christopher. I come from that company, and um, I'm here to talk about uh, dependency management. Uh, just to start things off, uh, by show of hands, who do some sort of semi-rigorous uh, dependency tracking and management? Right, so some, but uh, not nearly all. Um, this is something we started working on systematically a couple of years ago and have made a few mistakes along the way. Um, hopefully we can share some of uh, the things we've found to be working uh, properly. Uh, but uh, before we get started, um, what are some of the goals uh, in doing dependency management and, and tracking of those. Um, it can't be just for, for the sake of doing it. Uh, it there's got to be a utility to it. Uh, the first of it is uh, being able to run multiple applications that might be diverging in dependencies, version of versions of those dependency on the same systems. Uh, as Many applications have not yet been migrated to containers and run in isolation and all of that, and uh, we still need to deal with uh, call it legacy systems running on, on the same hosts, uh, not locked down. Uh, another thing that's uh, very important is to have a homogeneous development environment. Uh, if one developer pulls dependency for a project, the next developer should never have another set of dependency, so especially when interfacing with rather large uh, uh, modules uh, or large systems of modules like DBX class or modulicious uh, things where things do change and everyone needs to be uh, accepting the same re re uh, uh, reality of which me methods are available and how they're supposed to be used, used etc. Uh, but also, we need to be able to test module upgrades uh, easily, uh, or you'll just end up locking down the set of modules on from whenever you, you developed your application, and then three years down the road, when there's a critical security, uh, security vulnerability, then your up sheets creak and need to really pull those, those uh, all-nighters to figure out what do we need to change in this application to become current with uh, this module so that we can actually upgrade. Uh, and we also need to easily be able to test upgrades of Perl. Uh, we all like, well, we would prefer to follow upgrades of, of Perl, getting all the, the new goodies that uh, come once a year, and um, that's, not trivial when uh, when your applications become huge um, and you have a large set of dependencies. So when you have in the thousands of dependencies on modules, you have hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands of uh, lines of Perl code, this can be a chore and um, we can facilitate making this easier. Um, one thing that's been important for us to is to by all means, avoid the system Perl. Uh, this, is, this has become more and more important as some distros do absurd things uh, with, their, with their Perls. Uh, Reddit Linux, uh, at least the enterprise one, is uh, certainly a good example. Um, so, so we try to do that. Uh, there are two popular tools to, to do this um, that adds a layer of sugar on top of the, the underlying modules that do all the work. One of them is uh, Perl Brew, uh, which is, I guess, the most developers or development-centric ones. And the other one is uh, PLNV. Both are very good, uh, but solve things in their own way. Uh, they both support having multiple Perl versions installed at the same time, so you can easily switch be between them. Uh, Perl Brew, in contrast to um, PLNV, has a concept of libs, which is a collection of uh, libraries that you depend on. So you can have your Perl 5.26.0 installed, and you can have multiple separate installations of all your dependencies. For example, if you have a branch where you're testing, upgrading all of your stuff, that 
that can be a set of li li libraries. And if you have you're on the mainline master, the lockdown, everything should be okay here branch, then you can have that separate as well. Uh, I would say that PLNV is the is simpler and it's also less intrusive in terms of what it does to your shell. Uh, not everyone cares about this, um, so feel free to just test them test them both out. Worth noting, if you have installed Perl Brew and then install PLNV without nuking the Perl Brew installation completely, you will experience funkiness. So <laughs> make sure to clean that up. It, it does also say that in the PLM documentation, so just be mindful of it. Um, so with Perl Brew, handling different Perl versions is really simple. What you, what you do is you say to it, install this Perl and use this Perl. There. And you can also uh, switch so globally whenever you open a new shell that particular version of Perl is used so if you like to be bleeding edge then you can you can install the bleeding edges of, uh, of Perl switch to that Perl and have that be used for all your shells but when you do actual production work then you can switch to the organization mandated version of Perl uh, this works out really beautifully uh, with PLNV, it's mostly the same story, pretty easy. You install a Perl, you, you can use it for the current shell only, and you can set it globally. Basically the same commands, but a bit of a uh, difference in, uh, in words. One very nice thing with PLNV is, if you, in your project, put a file named .perl-version, PLN will, will consult that and automatically switch to that version of Perl for you. So you don't have to deal with switching between projects. If you just enter that directory and run some commands, it will run that command in the context of the Perl that's set in the, uh, the Perl version file. So that's really handy, especially if you're like we do. We, we, we uh, juggle many different projects. Some are locked on older versions of Perl, like 5.10, and some are pretty recent. And it's, it, you don't think about it that much, but it's a very nice day-to-day -day help. Uh, for isolating dependencies, um, Perl Brew, as mentioned, does give you some facility, uh, facilities to do that easily. You can create a set of libraries for on a particular set of uh, a particular Perl version, and you call it something of your choosing. That could be my app dash master or my app dot testing upgrade or whatever you want, and you'll instruct Perl Brew to to use the said library, and that will set a particular path in the shell for module make maker and all of that. So when you run tools like cpnm, it'll be installed in isolation, and when you run your application, it will only see those dependencies. So that's, that's pretty decent. Uh, it makes it easier to switch back and forth. You don't have to think about what's available on the system really at all. Um, PLN is sort of a different story. Um, it does have a plugin you can install to do the same thing as Perl Brew. I myself have never actually used that. I found it just as easy to just have this run. So I've got a shell alias uh, that I run whenever I'm going to work on a project and want that kind of isolation. Uh, and then it's just a matter of installing whatever it is you install, and that's, that's usually what we install the first. So use it for mostly all the work we do. Um, when it comes down to locking de down dependencies, we have many options. Uh, and I guess it speaks to the mantra of Perl that there's more than one way to do it. Um, you can be become pretty dizzy if you if you go, go online and look at all the permutations of ways of that people have done this. Um, 
you can, of course, do the crazy thing, manually pull archives from, from uh, CPA and maintain all of that by yourself, making all the proper directory structures, the packages, file, etc., so that CPANAM will uh, work with that. So you can also be super crazy and do manual builds of all of this and not rely on uh, CPANAM. Uh, I wouldn't advise it, but w there are people who do this. Um, don't know why. Uh, you can put stuff in a CPN file and lock down versions uh, directly there. Uh, the facilities there are good. Um, we used that for a while, but uh, we found it to be a bit too cumbersome to, to use, especially when, uh, when you're dealing with um, many projects. And yeah, it became sort of a, a mess for us. Uh, you can use Carton, which is another excellent tools. Uh, tool. Uh, there are some bugs uh, that are still open. Um, worth noting here is the author of Carton sort of abandoned it to work on another tool called Carmel. I don't know if he's back on Carton now or how that is, but there's been some back and forth. But uh, Carton, we use that a lot. It work, it's, uh, it's a pretty solid tool. Works very well. What Carton does is it reads your CPAN file, installs modules, and records what it's installed in a CPAN file dot snapshot. Um, this is similar to what is done in the Node world with the package lock JSON file, and also in the um, the Python whatever it's called. There's a right, yeah. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's also uh, a decent approach. Um, you can run your own pan. There are many good tools to, to do dark pans, uh, or pan being one of them. Um, this is also a very low threshold uh, deal. Uh, you have a tool, you, as a basically a command line thing, you, you say, now I want to pull this into my stack, and it'll be placed there, all the CPAN directory structure things will be um, preserved so that CPAN works as intended. Uh, you could, of course, run uh, Pinto. I don't know if you're familiar with it. If, if not, have a look at it. Uh, there are many good uh, sites to, to Pinto. That's more of a uh, large-ish uh, application. I'll get back to that. Uh, and you can also use uh, services like uh, Stratopan, which is a, uh, a service made by the other author of, um, of Pinto. Uh, Jeff Jeffrey Thalhammer is his name. Um, so f for Carton, uh, Carton will, as mentioned, read your cpan file dot snapshot um, and will record whatever you installed. Uh, it by the by using that facility you can pin versions of modules. And uh, it's got uh, commands to uh, bundle uh, those, um, uh, those dependency that you rely on to, to one directory, so you can ship that with your application and have Carton then install all your dependencies from that dire directory as well. Uh, this is especially relevant if you, like we have run into a couple of times, if you need to deploy to an environment where you, for example, have no internet access, so you cannot use CPNM uh, the way you're used to. Uh, it's, it's a great help and a, and, a, and a great tool in that respect. Um, and you run all your uh, commands with a special Carton exec uh, command. Worth noting there, if your application accepts command line parameters, do the double dash thing between Carton exec and whatever you want to run, or Carton will just happily eat all your um, uh, all the uh, command line um, options you pass to it. If it matches dash v or dash n or something, it just slurps them and your application doesn't get anything. So that's that's a gotcha. So using Carton, really simple. Um, one command to install dependencies. This is, uh, when you run Carton install like this, it just looks at your CPAN file, installs whatever's newest of the dependencies, 
and records it in the CPAN file snapshot. The snapshot file is meant to be checked into Git or SVN or, God forbid, CVS. But yeah, uh, check that in. And then, as mentioned, do the double dash thing so you're sure that nothing will be eaten by, by cotton. Um, you can also do a dash dash deployment. When you do dash dash deployment, it will only query the cpan file.snapshot for, for versions, and it will not try to install the newest versions of anything. Uh, that's useful when you have come to the point where you've pinned all your dependency and, and you want to stay there. Um, and they, the carton bundle commands put all the uh, the cpan archives into or well, for your application into the vendor directory, so you can just make an archive of that and ship that off. Uh, and lastly, the carton install deployment dash dash cached will not query cpan for anything, and it will only use the vendor directory uh, relative to where you run. Um, uh, carton from. So it only consults modules on disk uh, upon installation. That's very helpful. Uh, Pinto, uh, as I mentioned, that's another tool, and I'm probably going over time here, sorry about that. Um, it's got two important uh, concepts that's uh, important to, uh, to remember. You have um, uh, repo, and you've got a stack. Uh, you might view a repo as a project, at least that's how we've used it, and a, um, a stack uh, as a collection of distributions. Uh, this is comparable to um, the lib facility in Pearlbrew. So you can install your modules in several stacks for one application, and they might differ in versions, uh, thus making it easy to have a sort of long-lived repository of um, module versions that can be pulled and tested against, etc. Uh, you can also automate this so you have a running updated stack that you, for example, nightly run all your test suite uh, against, thus catching any issues that might be with the newer versions of various modules. That's a very useful thing to, to consider doing. Uh, and you can choose uh, Perl versions per stack. So, so you, can, you, you, can, you can really go crazy here if, if that's what you prefer. Uh, Pinto makes it trivial to test upgrades. Um, we've used it to, to great effect, um, and it's really helped us in, in our workflow. Uh, Mind you, Pinto is something that needs to be hosted. That is a burden that's worth considering. Pinto itself is not, um, it's not a heavy weighter. It's not difficult. It's not complex in any way, unless you start looking at the code. But, um, but no matter what, it's something you need to manage. And if you can avoid having that dependency in your stack, then it's probably best to look at other options. So using Pinto is basically very easy. You have your CPAN file with your dependencies. Um, and since we're an evil corporation, we have a .io domain. We have our project and the stack we're pulling from. And CPNM likes the uh, command line options. Um, and yeah, so we, we say use the mirror only to not go to, to CPAN. We tell it, install everything to a local directory, everything self-contained, and install dependencies based on this file. So with Pinto, you don't have the cpan file or snapshot you need to maintain. You just have the authority, authoritative stack here that basically says, yeah, this is the version you want. So that's it's pretty easy that way. Um, just to sum things up, there's more than one way to do it. Um, you need to consider your particular workload, um, your organization, what you can do, what you what you have, um, what you have the possibility of maintaining yourself, and what you need to sort of jerry rig. Um, 
our advice would be using PLNV or Pearlbrew for local lib handling, then using either uh, a combination of PLNV and uh, local lib, um, or um, yeah, uh, Pearlbrew for, for local lib installs. Uh, PLNV and bo both PLNV and Pearlbrew is fantastic for maintaining Perl versions. Uh, you lock versions with Pinto, Carton, or just uh, plain old uh, um, notate, annotating it in the CPAN file. That works uh, works well. Um, and just install modules using CPAN. Uh, well, consulting the uh, the CPAN file. Um, that's basically it. Right of time. Any questions? Uh, okay, so the question was, uh, did we try to use uh, Docker? Uh, yeah, we use uh, Docker in um, in several settings, but uh, not all organizations allow that kind of technology or have a runtime environment where it's even installable. So, so that's a um, a limitation. But uh, would using using Docker with any of these tools or fantastic. And if you use Docker, you can also just skip using all of them and just install everything as root in uh, the default directories. Yeah. If it's in isolation, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, some uh, libs uh, uh, depends on uh, external uh, developer libs, like, I don't know, lib png df or lib pg df, and uh, I don't know how to test different uh, versions of such modules without uh, Docker or virtual machine. Right, um, and, and uh, yeah, that's that's an issue, and, um, and that basically boils down to on the particular system you are going to deploy, how how do you manage uh, various versions of the different kinds of, uh, for example, libp, pg, uh, and all of that. So you got to consider that on a, a system by system basis. Um, but D Docker is a good tool to, to do just that and our recommendation currently. Any other questions? Sure. Uh, can you compare um, the various options that uh, you've described with using uh, uh, platform packaging tools such as RPM for a Red Hat lineage Linux system? Right, uh, so we've done RPMs, we've done DEBs, uh, and that, that's mostly what, what we've done. Um, we have started avoiding using either of them, uh, just because of the overhead it, it adds in the, uh, in the process of pushing out projects. Uh, and also, it's, bo both of those systems have a pretty steep learning curve, and it's easier for, for us to take a fresh developer and get him familiarized with these relatively simple tools and have uh, build pipelines and all of that that takes care of putting all of the th different uh, things in order. So uh, we did use RPMs, we did use DEBs, but we have moved away from, from doing that just because of added simplicity. I don't know if that answered your, your question. Right. Uh, that sort of assurance issues are important to management and captain. Yeah, um, and that's that's a very important consideration, and um, actually one of the reasons we we moved away from from doing uh, system packages was because we we started using too much time just managing uh, system dependencies and. Uh, packaging things so that they they were able to find each other, and it might have been just a knowledge uh, limitation on our side. But we, what started happening was we spent too much time managing system packages instead of doing actual development. And at that point, we figured, okay, either we learn this or we just drop it. And that's in the end what we ended up doing. So I can't share too much on uh, on that because we we basically hit a wall and decided we needed to go another direction. <laughs>
So sorry if that's a lacking response, but that that was our reality. And anyone else? Okay, great. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>